So anyway, uh, thanks very much for everybody for uh, coming along to your uh, SETI seminar series. Today we're uh, very fortunate to be joined by Alex Hayes, who comes down to us from Berkeley, where he's a uh, Miller Fellow at, uh, at Berkeley, doing his postdoc there. Uh, Alex got a BA from Cornell, uh, and uh, his PhD from Caltech. Uh, and uh, next year he'll be returning to his alma mater at Cornell as a professor. Uh, he's been hired there. And uh, he's a member of the uh, radar team on Cassini. And uh, he's particularly uh, interested in lake distribution, distribution of lakes and uh, statistics of lakes on Titan. Uh, and uh, he's also interested in bed form processes and surface processes on Titan and Mars as well. Uh, and uh, in particular, he's recently been looking at uh, the question of whether winds uh, could form uh, waves on the lakes. Uh, and uh, today he's uh, going to talk to us about uh, the best places to set up your beachfront home uh, on Titan. So if you will join me in uh, welcoming Alex. Okay, well thank you again for uh, taking the time to come listen to me today and also for the invitation. Before I start, uh, I just want to point out that the work you're going to hear from today is actually from a large collaboration of people, uh, mainly with, involved with the Cassini team, but also outside the Cassini team. Um, so they all deserve credit in addition to what you'll hear from me. And as alluded to just a second ago, the title of my talk is A Guide to Lakefront Vacationing on Titan, Hydrocarbon Lakes and Their Role in the Methane Cycle. And if I'm going to act as your travel agent to Titan, I have to show you a corny travel brochure. And here's my Titan travel brochure. Now, I know that you've had a couple of Titan talks already in this series, so I'll try and make the introduction light. But I do want to still give it, because it's such an exciting and invigorating story that sets up uh, the exploration of this, of this wonderful moon. So here is Titan, as seen from the Voyager 1 spacecraft in 1980. It's the largest satellite in the Saturnian system. And uh, prior to 1980, it was actually thought to be the largest satellite in the solar system. It's only, in fact, it's actually 2% smaller than Ganymede, but because of this extended um, atmosphere, we did not know that until radial occultation experiments uh, in 1980. Titan was originally discovered in the mid-17th century by Christopher Huygens, and then the next big bit of Titan discovery came from a Spanish astronomer named Joseph Comas Sola in the early 1900s, who believed he observed limb darkening on Titan that was then confirmed by spectral measurements of Titan's atmosphere from Gerard Kuiper, uh, with a plate from his 1944 paper shown here, which proved that there was actually methane lines in Titan's atmosphere, uh, suggesting that there was in fact an atmosphere, which then was observed by both the Pioneer and Voyager spacecrafts in 1979 and 1980, uh, which confirmed this thick, extensive atmosphere. And this uh, really set the stage for an exciting period where people were really interested in what was going on here. Uh, although the Voyager spacecraft's cameras could not penetrate the thick haze that made up Titan's atmosphere, through radio, radio occultation experiments, it did get an estimate of the surface um, radius of 2,575 kilometers. And through models of looking at how that occultation was diffracted through the atmosphere, we also uh, understood that the surface temperature was about 95 Kelvin. And the models were consistent with something like a 5% or so um, concentration of methane near the surface, which made things really interesting. Because if you look at the phase diagram of methane, that partial pressure and temperature puts it right near the triple point suggesting that we can have coexisting phases of solid gas and liquid in the Titan environment, which would be akin to water here on Earth, allowing us to have things such as evaporation, precipitation, perhaps fluvial or lacustrine bed forms on the surface. And then if we add to that the fact that this methane, unlike water on Earth, extends to about 2% levels up into the uppermost parts of the atmosphere, uh, we know that through high energy processes of uh, interactions with high energy photons from the Sun and Saturn's magnetosphere, those methane particles will be destroyed um, through a process known as photolysis, giving the methane in Titan's atmosphere a lifetime of about 26 million years, given current models. Which means that if you want this atmosphere to exist over geologic time, there has to be a source of this methane on the surface. In addition to that, you have to have a deposition of all the products of this big photochemical engine in the upper atmosphere. The primary product is believed to be ethane, which also happens to be a liquid on Titan's surface. And this set the stage for some early work by Jonathan Lunin and Dave Stevenson from Caltech, who postulated that perhaps Titan's surface was actually a global ocean. And so all of this led to the Cassini spacecraft, which is NASA's current flagship mission in the Saturnian system, to be launched. It entered the Saturnian system in early 2004. 
and launched a probe, which was part of the spacecraft provided by the European Space Agency known as the Huygens probe, which actually landed on the surface of Titan, meaning that Titan is the only other moon in our solar system to actually have a man-made object on its surface. And that probe was made to either float or land on a solid surface since we didn't know what we were actually going to find. And just to give you a hint of how exciting this must have been during this time, here's a uh, picture of the whiteboard from the break room at Caltech in 2004, where people are putting their bets on what the Huygens probe was going to land on. Okay? And things range from ice to tar, which would be the products of that methane photolysis in the upper atmosphere, to liquid. Uh, Darren Ragazine actually took the leap to say there would be a global ocean. Undetermined, um, dead on arrival, that's a little pessimistic, and Dave Stevenson from Caltech actually thought it would be eaten by a monster. Uh, I think the person who actually got it right was uh, Professor Mike Brown, who's also known for killing Pluto, who said that it's going to be tar, but we're not able to tell. Okay? Titan is just this land of mysteries, and even after being in the system for seven years and getting a host of data from the Cassini spacecraft that we're going to talk about today, we can still cannot tell you what the surface is made of. Okay? We can't say if it's primarily water ice or if there's a thick hydrocarbon draping of photolysis products. We just don't know. But what we can say is that it's a very interesting and familiar landscape based on process that gets you really thinking about how these landforms get created. Was Bruce Bruce Murray? Bruce was Bruce Murray, yes. And I should point out as well that I love being interrupted. If you have questions, please just throw them out. I'd rather have you be interested and uh, challenge me on something rather than just get bored. So ask questions as you will. I'll repeat them for the camera. So here are actually the images from Titan's surface taken by the Huygens probe in 2004. Uh, this is an image showing that the probe landed in this alluvial plain with decimeter scale, uh, decimeter, sorry, scale cobbles that are believed to be water ice. They look slightly rounded, perhaps being worked through this alluvial system that was shown during landing. This bottom right image is actually an artist's impression. It's not actually from the surface of Titan, uh, but gives you an idea of the scale of the spacecraft to those cobbles. So while there was not liquid oceans found, we did see evidence for some kind of fluvial reworking. There was also evidence from this little inlet at the base of the probe, which penetrated the surface and then was heated, that showed that evaporation occurred in the subsurface, saying that there was present liquid methane and ethane actually in the ground at this equatorial region. However, we still don't see those global oceans that's going to resupply the methane atmosphere or provide the deposition for the ethane that would have been generated over geologic time had the atmosphere persisted. However, later on in the mission, uh, we see evidence for those lakes, and one of the more iconic pieces of evidence for them come from uh, this observation, I believe taken in around 2009, from the VIMS instrument, which is an infrared instrument, showing a glint off one of the northern seas on Titan, shown right here. And this was just a fortuitous observation that was not planned. It just turned out that Titan happened to be in the specular geometry, such that, the sun, that it was between the sun and the spacecraft. And we show the specular reflection that could only occur if you had an extremely flat surface on the order of RMS degrees less than 0.2 degrees, probably much less. Okay? So there is actually liquids in the polar regions, and that'll be the focus of our talk. But before we get there, I just want to give you a slight tour of the landforms we see on Titan, because they're so similar to landforms you see on Earth, suggesting the same processes that shape our surface are actually happening on Titan. But before I even do that, I should mention the data we're going to use. And as I mentioned in the beginning, we're going to talk about the Cassini spacecraft, shown here. And because of Titan's thick atmosphere, which was known to be highly scattering and difficult to penetrate in optical and infrared wavelength, Cassini was equipped with a two centimeter radar. So the highest resolution views of the surface that we have actually come from this radar. This is the three meter dish shown on the top of the spacecraft here. Um, and you have to orient yourself a little bit when I show you these images, because we're not looking at optical infrared images that would be familiar to what we see with our eye. We're looking at radar images. Radar images are sensitive to roughness at the surface on the scale of the wavelength of two centimeters and the dielectric constant or properties in that frequency range. It's also important to mention that these radar waves, being much longer resolution, are going to penetrate through the surface. So you're not only seeing an image of the surface itself, but also the structure of the near subsurface. That's even more important on an icy satellite like Titan, because unlike Earth, where maybe you can penetrate through basalt and maybe eight centimeters of order, through pure ice, this radar can penetrate through 10 meters or so, through liquid methane. Uh, if our dielectric constant measurements are right, you can go through eight meters, okay? So we're talking significant penetration as compared to radar images that you might expect to see from water or more rock-type landforms on Earth. Yeah? Is penetration because of a homogeneous uh, <coughs> material that's working through? It's just the imaginary dielectric constant is significantly lower, lower loss tangents. In fact, if you really break up the surface, you're gonna make uh, more scattering centers and you'll have enhanced volume scattering and actually decrease penetration. Um, in fact, that's ultimately what we think limits the penetration through, through solid ice, is the defects in the structure. Um, however, 
So the radar images are collected into a synthetic aperture radar image, looking at an off-axis angle. So things that are dark can be thought of as smooth, and things that are bright can potentially be thought of as either rough or having an incidence angle locally oriented towards the radar. Okay? We also will talk a little bit about some infrared measurements from both the Imaging Science Subsystem, which is the Near-Infrared Telescope, and the Visual and Infrared Mapping Spectrometer, which is a grading spectrometer that operates between 1 and 5 microns. But as I mentioned before, these instruments are hindered by this thick atmosphere, uh, which uh, significantly scatters their light and reduces that resolution to several kilometers at best. So the Cassini radar saw through the thick atmosphere and actually gave us our first view of Titan's surface. Over the past, uh, I guess, six years that the mapping has actually been occurring, uh, we have about 45% of the surface mapped. Because the satellite is in orbit around Saturn, the strips that you see look like these oblique cylindrical little oblong pieces uh, as we capture Titan flying through in orbit around Saturn. Okay? About 45% of the surface has been covered to date, and that'll increase to about 50% um, by the end of the mission in 2017. Now, a couple of things just to, again, orient you to how interesting the satellite is. We were talking about how methane is near its triple point and may work as a surface fluid in making a methane cycle that's akin to Earth's water cycle. Well, if we took all the water out of Earth's atmosphere and deposited it on the surface, you get about two and a half centimeters or one inch of global liquid equivalent. If you did the same thing with methane on Titan, you get about 12 to 14 meters global equivalent ocean. Okay? So it's literally a wash and it's volatile. The atmosphere is significantly more extended as well. If you dropped all the nitrogen out of Earth's atmosphere, you get a layer about 10 meters thick. If you drop all the nitrogen out of Titan's atmosphere, which is also the primary constituent, you get about 140 meters. Okay? So a very thick atmosphere, four times denser than Earth, that's a wash with its volatile. Okay? Um, another interesting comment, by the way, uh, this is actually partially the work of Chris McKay, who's a, who's a local, um, is that nitrogen, the primary greenhouse gas in Titan's atmosphere, I know move this so you can hear me. The primary greenhouse gas in Titan's atmosphere uh, is methane, and if you remove that methane, which I mentioned is ephemeral through photolysis loss, you're going to drop the temperature by something like 10 Kelvin, bringing the poles cold enough to actually start condensing out the nitrogen. That then means that Titan's atmosphere may be, pr the, the presence of a substantial atmosphere on Titan may actually be predicated by the presence of that methane. Which meaning that if there is no continuous methane source, if there's any time period in Titan's history where that methane was removed, you can have a partial collapse of the atmosphere and actually set off uh, service processes in the geology. Ah, thank you. All right, Sorry. so moving on. I mentioned we're going to do a quick tour of the processes that are governing Titan's uh, surface. And the first that we see is within 30 degrees of the equator, there are these wonderful equatorial dunes that go for tens of kilometers in elongation extent and are separated by a few kilometers in spacing. Okay? These dunes are actually thought to be made of hydrocarbon particles derived from that photolysis. The process of how you get the micron size airfall dust particles into saltatable grains of 200 microns in size is still not known. But the fact remains that we see these dark streaks across the surface, which have been interpreted as hydrocarbon dunes. And these dunes actually interact with topography and divert around it. These bright regions here are about 800 meter mountains. And the dunes divert around them and abruptly stop on one side and then take a while to reconstitute on the other, suggesting that these dunes are elongating or have a resultant transport direction from the west to the east. That's interesting because that's meteorolo meteorologically difficult to understand given the rotation of Titan, similar to the rotation of Earth, which would have Coriolis forces tend to make winds on the surface blow from the east to the west. And it's actually been an interesting problem for the climate model people who work on Titan to actually explain these dune orientations with their models. Okay? And even though this talk is mainly on lakes, uh, since I agreed to give it, I've been working a little bit on dunes with a collection of people, including Ryan Ewing from the University of Alabama. And we're going to take a two minute diversion to talk about an interesting side note of these dunes and try to reconcile this problem with the wind directions. So here's an image showing the dunes on the Namib Desert of Earth in radar and dunes on Titan at the same scale, and they're very similar. Okay? And if you actually look at the patterns of these dunes, and this plot is just showing you the patterns of dunes with the x-axis being the spacing between the crests and the y-axis being one over the average crest length, or how long can you walk along a crest before the dune stops. And what you find, which is something you'd expect, because if you look anywhere from small sand, uh, small wind ripples, all the way to large Eolian dunes, without putting a ruler or some scale in the image, it's hard to tell how big they are, because dune ten dunes tend to form similar patterns. Okay? So we might expect a, a relationship to exist between various bed forms. Uh, on Earth, we have yellow dots here showing that, between the length of their crest on the y-axis and the spacing on the x-axis. 
However, what is not expected is that when you look at dunes on Mars and Earth uh, and Titan and do the same thing, they fall along the same line. Which means whatever is generating this pattern has to be independent of parameters like gravity, atmospheric density, and particle density, which is interesting. Now, we, I don't actually know how you generate this power law relationship. That's, uh, that's an active field of research. But the fact that they all are similar and fall on the same line is interesting and allows us to use models for dune reorientation time scales. How long does it take to form a dune pattern? People have built models calibrated using Earth data for deriving these values. And now this relationship suggests we can transcend those values to Titan. And what we see is not surprising. When you run through those models, you find that these really large scale, 100 kilometer long, tens of kilometer long dunes take a long time to generate. And if you change the winds, they take a long time to change the orientation, times of like a million years. Yeah? So there's only one point here from a paper by Ryan Ewing. Uh, there is unpublished data that also falls along this line from Mars, but, um, but the only published point, which is what I want to show, is shown here. What's also interesting is that when a dune field is either in the process of being reoriented or eroded, it plots off of this line. So you can actually see if a dune's degrading by where it plots on this line as well. And that's both seen on Earth and Titan. In places where we think the dune fields are being eroded away or degraded, they actually plot off of this line. So this line's a way to tell whether or not your dune field's in equilibrium with the wind environment. So uh, the last little slide before we get back to the lakes here uh, is showing in one of those degraded areas of the dune fields, what we see is these long crest lines. And then on top of them, this is a denoised radar image. You may not be able to easily see, but there are red lines I'm highlighting showing small crest lines like this one, this one, and this one that seem to be going in a different pattern than the larger dunes. Okay? This is interesting because these smaller dunes, which are either small uh, longitudinal dunes or perhaps even Barkhan or star dune forms, are still large enough that it takes a thousand years or so to generate them. So when you have a long dune, making a linear dune like this requires a bimodal transport regime. Okay, this is from the work of um, Dave Rubin from the USGS, okay, the primary method at which you generate these dunes. There are other methods, but they're probably less likely on Titan. That, bim that bimodal wind can either have a duty cycle where it seasonally varies very quickly and it's been persistent for a million years, which is the current uh, genre that people are trying to understand through the climate models, or perhaps that duty cycle can be slower over astronomical time scales associated with changing orbital parameters um, and still create those long crest lines. I don't know which way it is, but the fact that we have smaller dunes that are oriented away from the larger ones that are big enough that require consistent wind directions for a thousand years in a direction that's somewhat oblique to the long crest lines suggests that maybe these larger dunes are made over astronomical time scales of varying winds as opposed to seasonal. Okay? And if you're interested in that, you can. Uh, Look for more on that. We'll hopefully publish a paper soon. And I just thought it was a fun little new research side note. Now, moving on, we also see fluvial processes on Chiton. Uh, not only do we see channels, we see channels of different morphologies that suggest different slopes, different um, sediment loads. Uh, some channels are dark, suggesting perhaps either they're smooth or their valleys are smooth or maybe even liquid filled. Some channels are bright, suggesting perhaps there's more decimeter scale cobbles that have me reflections or corner reflections uh, occurring on them for the radar. And then finally, we have lacustrine processes. This is an image of La Gia Mare. We'll talk more about that lake later. But since I have a large image of it up, I'll show you. Uh, we'll talk a little bit now. This lake's about the size of one of Earth's great lakes. And what you see is uh, beautiful channel networks that flow into it. But you see two types. Okay? You see channel networks that flow into the lake and channels that terminate in shallow bays that look like drowned river valleys, okay? suggesting that this entire lake has a morphology consistent with drowned, drowning the topography of the region. But then you also have some channel networks that run parallel to the lake, that run parallel to the shorelines. They don't actually flow into the lake. Okay. That's evidence for pre-existing drainage networks that were present before the depression that filled the lake was formed and suggest a changing environment and a downdropping of topography since the generation of those pre-existing networks. Okay. And studying this, these morphologic interactions is actually the subject of my postdoc at Berkeley, working with Bill Dietrich, who's an expert on landscape evolution. Um, but looking at initial results suggests that Titan is really a place of dynamic change, where we're seeing changes on both seasonal, millennial, and astronomical or geologic timescales. And the rest of this talk will focus on seasonal and millennial timescales, but these channel networks are one example of timescales that are operating over even longer, time uh, even longer periods, uh, geologic periods, in fact. And then one last uh, process I'll mention is pluvial processes, or the processes of rainfall, geology of rainfall. This blink image is from a paper by Zibby Turtle from the Applied Physics Lab. It was published last year in Science. And what Zibby observed was with the infrared science uh, su imaging subsystem, the ISS instrument, an area of about 500,000 square kilometers. 
um, went from bright in the equatorial region to dark and then bright again over the period of two or three months. So here it's bright and then I'm outlining the regions that are going to hopefully, all right, we'll have to wait, bright, dark, there you go, the whole region just darkens and then it brightens again a couple of months later and in between the darkening and brightening a large cloud network was observed to move through this region. So this is believed to be the first evidence for a torrential downpour in the equatorial region suggesting widespread precipitation, wetting of the surface, and subsequent either infiltration or evaporation drying it again. So tight, yeah? The dark is wet and the bright is dry? That's the interpretation. The interpretation is that if you wet methane, uh, if you wet ice or even hydrocarbons with, uh, with liquid methane, it's gonna darken the surface. Okay, and there's experiments being done uh, with Christoph Sotan and another group at JPL to actually describe that quantitatively. So Titan's really a new world, and we can put it in with the other worlds who have a climate, Venus, Earth, and Mars, and we see very similar processes that are, inter that are uh, operating on completely different environmental parameters and physical conditions, okay? And that's really interesting, which means one of the things that I like as, a surface, uh, uh, as someone who works on surface processes is the fact that the same physics are happening with completely different scalings in terms of gravity, density, uh, and temperature, so we can actually see if we understand the physics of these processes that generate landforms on Earth by trying to ex uh, extrapolate those same laws to Titan and see if things make sense. Uh, but, as I mentioned, this talk is about the lakes, so uh, this is Titan's methane cycle. In the upper atmosphere, methane is destroyed on time scales of about 26 million years for an atmospheric equivalent. That, uh, those radicals that are created during that process form ethane, which will, form da which will collect in the polar lakes and seas and potentially in crustal sources as a liquid, and then other um, particles like acetylene and higher order hydrocarbons that are solid on Titan's environment that are believed to what's formed the dune particles and also perhaps drape the surface with some unknown depth. So the equatorial region is too dry for lakes even though there are rainstorms that happen on hundreds of thousand year timescales, uh, we think, and then the polar regions are perhaps too wet for dunes, um, so cohesive forces might prohibit saltation there. But if I was gonna ask how these lakes fit into this methane cycle, I'd ask you three questions. How do the lakes, just how are they distributed? What are they made of? And how do they in interact with the atmosphere and or the interior? And so let's go down those list of questions and start with the lake distribution. So here's an image of the north and south polar regions of Titan. The blue polygons are mapped lakes. There's about 700 or so lakes that we found so far. And the first thing you'll notice, notice is the largest lakes are in fact the size of Earth's Great Lakes. But there's significantly more surface area covered by liquid in the north as compared to the south. In fact, about 25 to 26 times more area in the north is covered in liquid than the south. Um, globally, about 1% of the surface is filled with lakes, but in the north it's 10% and in the south it's 0.4. So what could cause this asymmetry in the lake distribution? Well, uh, it could potentially be caused by some asymmetry in topography like we see on Mars. That it turns out to actually not be the case. And it's way too much liquid to consider moving it seasonally back and forth. So another potential explanation has to do with Saturn's orbit around the sun. It just so happens that Titan's southern summer or winter solstice occurs exactly or right near perihelion. So when you're 9 AE from the sun, but summer solstice, in the, uh, summer solstice or summer in the north occurs at aphelion when you're about 10 AU from the sun. This means that southern summers are shorter and about 25% more intense than northern summers. And any nonlinear transport mechanisms like Clausius Clapeyron could actually cause you to have a net migration of liquid from the south to the north over thousands of years, which would eventually build up your liquid in the, in the north and have it depleted in the south. And geologically, there's evidence for this in the fact that the northern lakes look like drowned topography with flooded river valleys that are not in equilibrium with the sediment delivery uh, from the channels feeding them. Whereas in the south, as we'll show later on the talk, there's evidence for some paleo shorelines in some lakes and significantly fewer liquid. If you appeal to this explanation, however, which is published uh, by Odetta Harrison in Nature Geosciences in 2009, uh, well then you have to also appeal to the fact that orbital parameters change, just like Earth. And so if you look at the position of Titan's seasons as a function of time, the exact opposite situation where summers in the north are hotter and shorter occurs about 35,000 years ago. And this thing cycles with about a 50,000 year period. So the primary uh, determinant on the position of the seasons in the eccentric orbit is apsidal precession, which is also thought to be one of the most important um, Blankovich periods here on Earth that determine glacial cycles. So if we do want to say that this orbital configuration is the cause for this dichotomy in the lake distribution, you have to appeal to it changing on 50,000 year timescales, which is interesting and perhaps hard to do.
And uh, as I just mentioned, there are, uh, it's Titan's Milankovitch periods is a way to think about it. And the primary period is about 45 to 50,000 years, but there are, of course, longer term periods as well. But now let's talk about the lakes individually a little bit. This is uh, looking in the North Polar region. We not only see lakes, we see lakes of different size and different evolutionary state. So we see these dark lakes, as we call them, because they're radiometrically dark, consistent with being filled with liquid. And then we see bright lakes that are actually holes in the ground that are consistently where we have topography, of, which is only about a dozen of them, actually. They're consistently 150 to 300 meter holes in the ground. Okay? And they have borders that look very similar in shape to these dark lakes. Uh, recently, Jason Barnes from the University of Idaho published a paper where he looked at the infrared spectra of these empty lakes, we call them, or these holes in the ground, and found that the interior is distinct from the exterior, and, cons and uh, his interpretation was you're looking at hydrocarbon evaporate deposits that are sitting in the basin of these empty lakes. This is also consistent with the radar data, which showed early on that the uh, scattering properties of this material is different than the scattering map properties uh, of the surrounding area. Yeah? How deep are the lakes? Uh, we don't know how deep the liquid lakes are, although I'll talk a little bit about one particular one in the south later. But these holes are 150 to 300 meter holes in the ground, although the filled lakes I don't think are filling up the holes completely. Okay? Maybe the large seas, people are talking hundreds of meters, and the smaller lakes 10 meters or so or less. Uh, some lakes look really shallow. Some even look like mud flats as opposed to lakes. Other ones, you really can't tell. There's actually a, a mission that if we have time at the end, I'm going to talk about. For those of you that are planetary scientists might know that there's a mission called TIME, Titan Mare Explorer, which is currently in phase A of the discovery competition. It's between uh, three missions. And we might actually be funding a boat to land in La Gia Mare to directly measure the depth using a uh, depth finder like you might find on your, or a fish finder on your boat. So hopefully if that mission gets selected, uh, we will be able to answer your question more fully. Now, we have these holes in the ground, and whenever I see pictures of Titan, I think of the Beatles song, The, uh, the Yellow Submarine Sea of Holes, but I have no idea how these holes formed. All right? And it's actually difficult to think up ways to form these things. Um, they stochastically do not have uh, size distributions consistent with impact or volcanic caldera distributions. Um, people have thought that perhaps they're karstic, maybe they're solution pits. Dissolution pits, I'm sorry, you're eating away at the ground, but that requires that whatever the surface is made of has to be soluble in liquid methane ethane uh, and the higher order hydrocarbons that are mixed into it. And in order to do that, you cannot have water ice. You have to have perhaps a large 100 meters draping of these photolysis products built up over geologic time. Maybe that's possible. Some models think it is, but it's hard. Um, it's hard to reconcile. Other processes, preglacial processes on Earth, typically uh, require freeze-thaw processes of, of water, which is not going to happen on Titan either. So um, maybe one piece of outstanding research on Titan is coming up with a way to form these holes in the ground. Uh, moving on, we also see lake morphology, varying morphologies. Here's two examples. I like it because I have Earth and Titan on the same slide. On the right column here, we have Earth. And on the left, uh, from the radar, shuttle radar topography mission, and on the left, we have Titan. And what I'm showing is just that we see small lakes that have no interconnecting channel networks to the resolution of the radar. They look very simply like they're consistent with uh, seepage terrain or terrain that's interacting through subsurface flow, like the Everglades region of Florida. Other lakes we see have beautiful dendritic channels flowing into them, like you might see in the land of lakes of Wisconsin or Minnesota, uh, dominated by surface runoff. And we see a whole range of lakes in between. Um, and just studying these morphologies and really trying to understand how these lakes interact um, I think will really help us understand how Titan's hydrocarbon cycle works in, in its whole. So here's the North Polar region in, uh, in all of its glory. There's really three main regions that we can think about, or four actually. We have these area of large seas that sit in the lowest area topographically that look like they're consistent with drowned topography, although some other complex relationships and processes are also going on. And we have smaller lakes. Uh, the lakes here just tend to, uh, in broad brush, have channel networks flowing into them, interconnecting to them, uh, although there are also isolated lakes, whereas the circular region here uh, shows lakes that typically do not have channels interacting, and these are the topographically highest parts of the North Polar region. So tentatively, you would think that perhaps these lakes might flow through the subsurface and drain, filling up the larger seas and lowest depression. And one way to try and understand that is to look at how these lakes evolve over time. So, unf yes? So what's the topographic About a kilometer. Uh, between the lowest parts of the, the shoreline of these seas to the highest parts over here, 800 meters to a kilometer. It's, Titan is flat, except for it's not, is how I would explain it. Now, I just want to talk a little bit about these lakes and the fact that we can use them for, to look at temporal evolution. So this is just a thought project. On the left-hand picture here, I have a little cartoon showing 
a hole in the ground filled with hydrocarbon liquid that's sitting in an unsaturated regolith with some saturated alcanifer or methane equivalent water table sitting some distance B between the base of the lake. On the right side, we have more of a swamp terrain where the, where the water table goes all the way up to the surface, or the alcanifer reaches the surface, and everything is saturated. So what happens when we turn time on in both these cases? Well, in the left case, just like dumping a, a bucket of water at the, at the ocean or at the beach, it's going to vertically infiltrate very quickly, and you're going to create this hockey puck of methane that's going to slowly horizontally diffuse from overburden pressure. And in this other case over here, evaporation is going to empty the lake, but then the saturated regolith could potentially infill it. Now, in both these situations, for a given set of physical parameters of the, of, the, of the regolith, things like permeability and porosity, we can calculate how long it would take to drain these lakes, in this case, or actually fill this lake over here. And that time scale actually depends on lake size. And the way you can think about that is that smaller lakes will have more area in their sides and interact more with the subsurface than the atmosphere, which is determined by the plan view area. Whereas really big lakes will, will interact mainly with the atmosphere and not through the subsurface. So if you look over a period of time, and the calculations and models suggest about 10 years is about the right time scale for the properties we think may be on the surface, you might see a difference in the evolution of the small lakes to the large lakes that you can use to derive something about the subsurface hydrology. Okay? And I mention this because May of this year represents the first time we're going to get a view of these small lakes with a baseline of, of long enough, I think it's about seven years we'll get the baseline this May, to actually possibly see these changes. So it's going to be very exciting. And over the next six years, I'm um, sorry, no, 2012, next five years, uh, until the end of the mission in 2017, we're going to repeatedly look for surface changes and differences in the evolution of these lakes to do studies like this to try and understand uh, the importance of the interaction with the subsurface and the atmosphere. All right. So now I want to move to the South Polar region. And we immediately see it's very different than the North Polar region. There's only one large lake uh, in the South Polar region known as Ontario Lacus. It looks different than the lakes in the north, and we'll focus on that in a second. There's a couple of smaller other lakes, as well as areas like this, which are dark, aren't consistent with liquid, but perhaps consistent with saturated regolith um, that look like mud flats, perhaps. Uh, and when you look at them, you actually see evidence for pulse dissection, suggesting that there's actually been a reduction in the liquid level and downdropping of topography, just like we see in the north. So the morphology even in, suggests that over geologic time, there's been modification of the surface here as well. Um, but I do want to talk about Ontario Lacus, which happens to be my favorite lake on Titan, and was also the subject of a SETI talk last year by a graduate student named Lauren Y from Stanford. So this is Ontario Lacus. It's shaped like somebody's right foot. It's about 270 kilometers in its long axis and 70 kilometers in its width. And um, it's one of my favorite lakes on Titan because when you look at it, you see evidence for so many different processes. On the western side of the lake, we have this complex shoreline with a series of lobate forms that terminate the end of this channel which might be interpreted as a delta. So this entire side looks like depositional morphologies. Where when you look on the eastern side of the lake, you see a very smooth shoreline that has been interpreted as a beachhead, perhaps being eroded by wave action. But we don't know what the pre-existing basin looked like. So it could also just be an artifact of what the basin looked like before it was filled. However, this looks like an erosional morphology. And then we have these 800 meter mountains on the side butting up against the northern part of the lake, uh, showing tectonic morphology. So on just one lake, we have evidence for uh, depositional, erosional, and tectonic processes. Okay, I just find that exciting. And we also, Cassini gave us a Christmas present in 2008 around this lake. Right around Christmas, there was an altimetry pass taken across the lake where the, instead of looking off axis and creating synthetic aperture radar imagery, the spacecraft was pointed straight down and used to measure time of flight for alt altimetric height measurements and also look at the normal incidence backscatter from the surface of the lake. This data was analyzed by Lauren Y, and this was the subject of that SETI talk uh, last year. And what Lauren was t uh, found was that when you look at um, a rough surface in an aider geometry, okay, you're sending out a known waveform from the radar. And if the surface topography is such that it varies modulus the wavelength um, a lot, you'll get incoherent addition of the reflected radiation. And if you look at a distribution of the amplitudes that you get back, or a histogram of the received amplitudes in a radar bin, from one of those bursts, you should get a Gaussian profile if you have a rough surface. And when you look at the surface features, that's this black histogram, you actually see this beautiful Gaussian-like distribution consistent with a fairly rough surface on the order of the wavelength. However, from the position where the altimeter hit the corner of the, of the, lake, of the tentative lake shoreline here to off the edge of the tentative lake shoreline, you saw these red, your uh, histogram of your amplitudes was this red distribution. And there's two interesting things about this red distribution. One, it's a saddle shape. Okay? And two, it's quantized. You don't see uh, amplitudes all over the spectrum. You see them at specific points. Both these features point to this being a near-perfect specular reflection. Okay? 
Um, if you think about it, any sensor has an integration time. So you're measuring the amplitude at set time, time endpoints. If you have coherent addition of the radiation coming off the surface, you're getting a mirror reflection of the waveform you send out, which means as it repeats, you're going to be measuring specific amplitudes along its distribution, and your histogram should be quantized just like it is here. Also, the histogram of the sinusoidal echo that's sent out is a saddle shape. Okay? So both those observations point to this lake being a near-perfect mirror during this observation, and Lauren was able to constrain the surface roughness to three millimeters. So if you want to go water skiing, this is where I'm going to send you. There's my tour guide response. Okay? However, this is really interesting, because if you look at any radar image of the Earth's ocean, or the Earth's lakes, whatever you might find, this is an L-band radar image of the northeast coast of the United States. And there's only one piece of land, Nantucket Island, in the top of this image. All the other structure you see is from waveforms on the, on the ocean surface. In fact, here's a storm front coming through. So this is the, the winds associated with the storm front. All these other things are either atmospheric um, wave patterns or changes in the depth of the ocean. But when you look at these Titan lakes, they're completely black. You see no evidence for wave activity. And then these altimetry measurements also show no evidence for wave activity, as did that surface glint from VIMS. So what's going on? Well, it turns out it has to do, potentially, with the physics of how you transfer energy from the wind to the liquid. Okay? So Titan, the things that govern the kind of winds you need to make waves are surface tension and gravity, both of which are less on Titan um, and suggest that it would be easier to generate waves on Titan. And when you go through the models, uh, this is a result, this is a, uh, a application of a model by Mark Donilon and Don Pearson in 1987 where I took the Titan parameters, put them into their, form, uh, their model for the initiation or threshold of wave activity, and found that you need winds of between 0.4 and 0.7 meters per second to generate waves on a Titan lake for a range of viscosities. Okay? The primary reason this varies is because the viscosity of the liquid can vary anywhere from pure methane, which is five times less than the viscosity of water, to complex hydrocarbon mixtures that are two times the viscosity of water. And that variation in viscosity uh, changes the threshold wind speed you need to excite waves. Either way, it's still easier than generating waves on Earth which are, have a threshold between 1.6 and 2 meters per second. But Titan's a very cold place with very small temperature distributions and rotates slowly. So GCM models predict that you have very slow wind speeds. And in this uh, plot I put up here, I have a plot of uh, planetocentric solar launch due to effectively season or time versus the average wind speed uh, from a model, or actually the 95% quantile of the wind speed from a model by um, Tapio Schneider at Caltech that was published in Nature, I think, this month, actually. And the two lines I have plotted are for two latitudes, the latitude associated with Ontario Lacus, 70 south and black, and the latitude associated with Kraken Marion North. The crosshatch pattern is the range of wind speeds we need to generate waves. And what we find is that during the Equinox mission, when all these observations of no waves were taken, which goes from here to here, these two lines are well below this crosshatch region. But as we move into northern spring and summer during the Solstice mission, which is where we are right now, we're about here, these winds are going to freshen and actually, the prediction suggests we might start seeing waves uh, as Cassini continues on. And what's even more interesting is that if you are careful and do a good Bayesian analysis, you might actually be able to say something about the viscosity of the liquid composition based on when you start seeing waves if these GCMs are correct. Uh, but I want to move on because we're running a little low on time. Another interesting thing we can do with the altimetry data, in addition to looking for waves at Ontario Lacus, is also to look at how shallow the slopes are in this basin. And what we find is this is a very shallow basin with slopes on order 10 to the minus 3 or 10 to the minus 4, meaning you have to walk um, 10 to, uh, 1 to 10 kilometers to drop 1 meter in elevation. Very shallow. That's good because the radar on Cassini uh, has a resolution of something like 300 meters, which typically means when you look at steeper sections of shoreline, uh, your liquid gets really deep very fast, and you can't ever think to actually see through it, despite the fact that we think you can slightly penetrate it. At Ontario Lacus, we can actually be, sh we're shallow enough where we can look at the radar return as a function of distance from the shoreline and potentially hope to see penetration off of the, the lake bottom. And when you plot the radar albedo as a function of distance from the shoreline, you see an exponential decay in the signal. So that's what you expect if you have a model where you have a constant sloping uh, off the beach, you have a constant sloping lake bed, so you're getting, as you go further from shoreline, deeper and deeper through the liquid, that's going to attenuate more and more. Now, this is just one model. You can also come up with compositional variations or anything you might want to explain this exponential decay. But if you assume that the lake has liquid in it, and in fact has a constant shoreline, the shape of this exponential tells you the properties of the, the lost tangent of that liquid, how absorptive that liquid is to uh, microwave radiation. 
And the result you get from modeling this is a loss tangent of about 10 to the minus 3. That's the ratio of the complex to the real component of the dielectric constant. And that number is important for two reasons. One, it tells you something about the composition, although not much. But the value is consistent with um, methane, ethane mixed with higher order hydrocarbons. In fact, the absorptivity of this liquid is not thought to be primarily due to methane or ethane, which are nonpolar liquids. It's thought to be due to the higher order polar constituents that might be, might be in there. Uh, the other reason you can use is if you assume that the composition and the, uh, the loss tangent in the Ontario locus translates to other lakes, and this is the right number, any kind of albedo reflection difference, as you see in other lakes, can be turned into depth changes. Okay? But I also will point out that this value is completely predicated on the model that assuming that the lake is filled with liquid and has a constant sloping profile, and that the profile is the one we measure from altimetry just off the shoreline. In other words, there's no discontinuity and slope, discontinuity and slope just offshore and just inshore, which may or may not be true. But if you run with that, you can, as I mentioned before, turn backscatter variations down into depth measurements, assuming that loss tangent. So if we walk around the lake, we can actually make a bathymetry map of it by looking at exponential decays elsewhere and using the loss tangent value where we assumed a slope where it intersected with the altimetry profile, and you make this bathymetry map. Okay? That's proportional to any break in slope uh, at that altimetry intersection. And what we find is that the exponential decay suggests that you have steeper shorelines here where it's smoother and thought to be erosional, and shallower shorelines here where it's thought to be depositional. And these slopes that you measure from this bathymetry measurement actually correlate to slopes that Randy Kirk from the US Geolog Geological Survey has made uh, using stereo DTMs, just using the parallax measurements from overlapping stereo imagery. This technique has recently been adapted to the north as well by a postdoc at Caltech named Anton Lucas. And Antoine made a uh, preliminary depth map here of Crack and Mari in order to study those drowned river, to, uh, drowned river valleys. So there might be some more to look for the, uh, in this effect now coming up. However, I should point out that this lake is a strong part of, uh, is a strong feature of controversy amongst the scientists who work on Titan. Particularly the VIMS team tends to think that perhaps it's not even filled with liquid, perhaps only the center is filled with liquid and the rest is a mud flat which means we have to come up with some other explanation to explain the exponential decay in the backscatter. And I just find it really interesting because it's actually proven to be difficult to reconcile the infrared observations with the radar observations and make a consistent story. So you'll probably see a lot more talks about this lake coming up until people converge. Another controversial portion of this lake is that there has been evidence that it's changed over time. So this is a, these are observations from Jason Barnes of the University of Idaho. So he's bathtub rings around the lake in the infrared, suggesting that there were paleo shorelines. And then if you really take a stretch of the imagination, you can look at some low resolution images of the lake from 2005 taken by the ISS instrument and compare them to even lower resolution uh, images taken by that same instrument in March 2009. And if you squint your eyes um, about the radar team and the ISS team consistently would say that this lake potentially has shrunk whereas other people would say it hasn't. We don't know if it has or not, but there's maybe evidence that it's shrunk. And if you look with the radar, the radar profile is more consistent with the later infrared observation than the earlier infrared observation. Uh, and even though it's very difficult and dangerous to do inter-instrument comparisons, if you do it. So if I walk around the lake and say, how, long, how much did it potentially shrink? You can make a plot of the recession distance versus the slope we measured. And if you had a constant drop in liquid level, you'd expect there to be a linear relationship because places where it's shallower, it's going to recede more for a constant depth change than places where it's steeper. And in fact, you do see a linear relationship, and the slope of this line should be the depth change in time. Now again, we don't know if this is right, but under this model, this suggests meter scale per year depth changes between 2004 and 2009, which is surprising because that's, uh, that's a lot of liquid depth change. That's more than you'd expect from simple evaporation. And if it is right, uh, may actually suggest that there's some more interaction with, an, uh, with a subsurface alcanifer and there's infiltration happening as well. We don't know though. And again, this value would be um, proportional to any assumptions in the model for the bathymetry, which include that there's no break in slope. We also see evidence for change in smaller lakes. And in these smaller lakes, what we find is that between observations taken about a year or two apart, we have dark features inside these red outlined depressions that are consistent with partially filled lakes, so lakes that are shallow enough to see through to their floor. And later, there's no evidence for that, for that, uh, for that dark feature. Okay? So it looks like there's perhaps been a temporal change here. But it's hard to discern whether or not there's been a temporal change because radar observations are very sensitive to observational geometry. That's a lot of saying. So you have to try and back out whether or not this change is due to incidence angle effects, 
looking at a different orientation or actual temporal change. And one way to do that is to compare these changes to all the other backscatter measurements as a function of incidence angle on Titan. And I don't want to spend too much time on this slide, but I'll point out that the x-axis here is the incidence angle of the observation, the primary variant for uh, the backscatter we see. And then the y-axis is the observed normalized radar albedo, or um, normalized backscatter. What I'm showing in red are all of the empty lakes we see on Titan. The backscatter, all of those holes in the ground. All the blue features are all of the lakes we think that we can see through to the bottom of, lakes that are shallow enough that we actually get a return from them. And what I've plotted on top of it is that the features that have not changed between those two observations are black, and they plot directly in the class of all those empty lakes. Whereas the features that I said may have changed go from being consistent with the other lakes on Titan to being consistent with the empty lakes on Titan. So we tend to interpret this as the actual features have partially evaporated or infiltrated into the ground. Or the other alternative is they represent a surface that we've never seen uh, a backscatter relationship like this anywhere else on the surface. And you can model that to get a flux or depth change that you get about 0.6 to 0.7 meters per year consistent with what we get from Ontario Locus, although I will point out that this all backs to the same assumptions on the loss tangent, and any changes in that will change these flux rates. And now uh, we've been talking about the south, so I'll finish up by just mentioning the north. Um, we didn't get a lot of observations in the north because just to do with the energetics of Cassini's orbit, it turned out that we got many observations of the north in 2006, 2007, and then did not get any observations again until another Christmas present in 2009, giving us our first baseline for change detection in the North Polar region, showing that La Giamare shoreline, shown here, did not change to the pixel. There's been absolutely no change. But um, perhaps the large seas aren't the best place to look for change, so I'm going to take you to my second favorite feature on Titan. And that's these small lakes here, which are 150 to 300 meter holes in the ground with very shallow, shallow floored depressions that are filled in the middle with interpreted as liquid. Okay? So we have a hole in the ground, shallow sloping flat floored, partially filled with liquid. So if anything's going to change, this is where I point to look. All right? And between 2007 and 2009, there's, not, there's no change in these features either. So it looks like there might have been change in the south. In addition to the radar measurements I showed you, uh, Zibi Turtle has also published papers on infrared observations of lakes appearing and disappearing. And in the north, there's been no observed changes. Well, does this match what we think the climate's going to do? So this plot uh, is, a is a reproduction of a figure from a paper by Tapio Schneider that's actually published this month, not 2011, but 2012. And what he's showing is time on the x-axis, or season, versus latitude on the y-axis. And the color represents evaporation or net evaporation or precipitation under the surface. And what his model predicts is that between, sol between the beginning of summer up to solstice, you have net precipitation in the south, and between solstice and equinox, you have net evaporation in the south of order something like 0.4 to 0.6 meters per year, consistent with what we observe, um, given all the assumptions I mentioned earlier. But nothing going on in the north. However, the real test of this model is going to come in the next couple of years, where this GCM, at least, predicts that we're going to start having net gain of liquid in the north, um, so some of those lakes might start to fill up. And that leads me into my summary which shows that we have a collection of lakes on Titan with complex morphologies that tell us something about the hydrocarbon cycle. How the lakes change with time might tell us how they interact with the subsurface, and we can look forward to the beginning of those measurements and models starting later this year. Ontario Locus has taught us a lot. It's a controversial feature, but the radar observations suggest that perhaps a shallow lake and give us, gives us a loss tangent that we can use to measure depth changes elsewhere, where we see backscatter variations that also suggest uh, a change in the south. There is a uh, no change in the north, but yet the GCMs actually predict that this is consistent with what we might expect. And the real test will become whether or not we see changes in the north uh, in the coming years. And finally, the lake asymmetry on Titan might be associated uh, with Titan's orbital parameters. But if you appeal to that solution, you also have to appeal to the fact that it changes on 50,000 year timescales. But now, what do you have to look forward to? Well, um, you've seen a lot of radar data primarily because, uh, like the northern parts of Norway on Earth, the northern parts of Titan are either in, are sometimes in direct sunlight consistently, uh, or they're in complete darkness. So there's been no reflected sunlight with which the infrared instruments have been able to observe the surface. And just as the sun starts rising in the North Polar region over the next few years, we can start to expect a collection of observations with the infrared instruments of the northern lakes, and maybe expect to see changes. Uh, I just show this plot to show what's coming up. These red and green polygons represent what the observations through 2017 will show us in the North Polar region of Titan. And I'm actually really excited for these observations because unlike the observations to this point, we're no longer just discovering 
new ground, looking for new things, which is really exciting. But each of these observations has been targeted to answer a specific scientific question based on analysis of previous data. So every one of these um, passes should tell us something about Titan that we specifically want to understand, which is exciting. And then finally, I'll just uh, put a plug out for the Titan Mare Explorer mission, showing that uh, we want to return to Titan Lakes. And one of the discovery missions up for competition right now is a sending a lake, sending a boat to Ligia Mare to land in, I think, 2023. Um, and it's going to be really fun. This boat will have depth finders and other things that will tell us about the depth of the lakes, link to geophysics, look at the shoreline processes, uh, and tell us, most importantly, what the composition is of these liquids. And with that, I'll, uh, I'll take any questions you might have. Thank you. Uh, just wait for the mic to come around. Uh, so Alex, I have a, a question on, you mentioned the infiltration process. Uh, is, there, is the possibility of the, the, the transfer of the liquid uh, subsurface in a subsurface aquifer between the poles, is that a potential? Uh, yeah, so people have talked about global transport in the subsurface, and the timescales for that will be very long. Uh, Jeff Andrews Hanna at the University of Colorado is applying his Mars models to Titan to see whether or not that makes sense. But uh, I will comment that when you look at the, the craters that you see, which are primarily only in the equatorial regions, we don't see many craters in the polar regions. Uh, when you look at the crater walls, which go down sometimes up to a kilometer in depth, you don't see any uh, transitions that might suggest that there's some kind of a change in composition or saturation along the wall. And we all, um, so I'm not sure. There might be some kind of block to the uh, subsurface transport. There's no region that you'd expect it to be global. It may be restricted to regional in the poles. <coughs> Um, is the planned mission going to Ontario Lacus or some other body? It's going to La Gia Mare. Uh, Ontario Lacus will be below, the Earth will be below the horizon at Ontario. Um, and why was that? Just, uh, just Titan season. It's, uh, Saturn season is 29 and a half years, so you only have uh, a certain portion of that season over which you can see the Earth from the surface. And that mission is a direct to Earth mission. I should also point out that Ontario Lacus is thought to be fairly shallow, um, so we're not, we can't be confident that you won't hit the bottom. And it's also a small target compared to La Gia Mare or Kraken Mare, which are uh, much larger. Hi. Over here. Ah, yes. So um, when, you, when the winds allegedly pick up and mm -hmm. you theoretically get waves, how big are the waves are we talking about? OK, well, for the same wind speed, uh, the fully developed sea, the, the significant wave height, which is the height of the, the average of the third highest wave height, um, is about seven times larger than on Earth. Um, but for the wind speeds predicted, uh, you're probably not going to get much bigger than 0.6 or 0.7 meters. So in the largest seas, they're approaching the tidal amplitudes. Um, but probably you're not going to see very large waves. Although the observations that we're going to be looking for waves with, which is radar and glints, are most sensitive to the smaller scale waves, not the larger ones. Could you, uh, could you tell us anything about the temperature, temperature variations, and what okay. effect they might have? Yeah, so equator to pole is something like 3 Kelvin. Uh, the surface temperature averages about 95 Kelvin. And the radiometric observations we have of the lakes, uh, people are still analyzing them, but they suggest that the lakes are at most only different by 2 to 3 Kelvin between the lake and the surface. So you're not going to expect much onshore or offshore breeze developing. And the general diurnal temperature variations are also similar to the equator to pole variations of, of less than a one or two or three Kelvin. Uh, sorry. You mentioned that you expect low wind speeds yep. <clears throat> on Titan, and you talked about the wind speeds that would give you waves. Have you given any thought to what wind speeds would be required to make those dunes? Yeah, so um, there's been a paper by Ralph Lorenz in 2006 on that, and he predicts something like a meter per second. But I'd stress that um, that's based on doing the same analysis you do on Earth, where on one side uh, of, of a plot of threshold wind speed versus particle size, gravity determines the slope on the larger particle end of the spectrum. And interparticle forces de de determine the slope on the smaller end of the particle spectrum, or cohesive forces. We have empirical estimates of what cohesive forces like van der Waals are for silicate grains. I have no idea what they're going to be for hydrocarbon grains. So I don't know how much I should trust the derived values that use empirical um, cohesive properties appropriate for silicates. But it, in, uh, for certain, it will be fairly large and probably larger than or comparable to what you need to generate waves. Um, and in fact, the GCMs have difficulty getting winds that high. Uh, and Tetsuya Takano's model actually predicts that they only happen at equinox um, during some special atmospheric conditions that allow you to have stronger winds. OK. Hey, regarding continuing ob observations, 
Is Cassini shutting down in uh, 2017 due to RTG running down or budget or what? <sighs> well, Cassini's end of life is 2017. I believe it has to do primarily with the, the Delta V, the fuel, the Delta V associated with how much fuel is left for doing maneuvering. Okay. And, and, and you have to ensure that you're not going to have planetary protection issues by landing on Titan. Uh, and the death is actually really interesting. They figured out a way to have Cassini go between the end of the rings and the beginning of Saturn's atmosphere and then use Titan to bring its, peri bring its periaps closer and closer to Saturn, moving into the atmosphere with time until it eventually burns up. So the people who study Saturn's atmosphere will be getting GCMS data as a function of depth into the atmosphere up until we can no longer see the spacecraft. Anybody else? Yeah. You've mentioned that uh, there's a very slow rotation for mm -hmm. uh, Titan. Uh, that there's uh, something like a three Kelvin uh, temperature gradient. Uh, so it doesn't seem like there's very much to drive circulation of the atmosphere or, uh, or these lakes. Yep. Uh, and so I was wondering uh, uh, how you can uh, really have a cycle and and processes like deposition and erosion that parallel Earth? Well, uh, I'll answer that in two parts. The understanding of how strong the winds will get given the rotation and temperature difference, uh, I can't really do in the back of the envelope. I really have to appeal to the results of the GCMs that come out, which are predicting wind speeds that may be high enough um, during the summers to actually do erosive work and actually produce waves. The second thing I'll say is that from a surface morphology standpoint, there are features that just look like they need to be created through depositional erosive processes and require some kind of dynamic climate. Uh, and, and then do you think of the different uh, solubility characteristics of water and hydrocarbons yep. and you wonder what deposition and erosion means? I, that's a great question. I don't know the answer and that's one of the fundamental issues right now is water ice is not soluble into liquid methane or ethane, which if those are karstic dissolution pits to form those little holes in the ground, you need to have something um, primarily making up your top layer that is soluble in methane or ethane, which is, has to be maybe photolysis products, but I don't know. And I'm not claiming that there are a large draping of photolysis products. I'm actually saying, tell me another way to make a hole in the ground, because I'd like to know. Well, I'm not uh, sure if that answered your question or not, but <laughs> it leads back to one of my initial statements that we still don't know what the surface of Titan is primarily composed of. We have another container for your liquid ethane or methane ah, here. Thank you. <laughs> Please join me in uh, thanking Alex for his great talk. <laughs>